Over the last few games, Pistons fans have finally gotten to see what they've been asking for all season, and that is for Jay and Ivy to have the ball in his hands a lot more. And he has had the ball in his hands, and he's looked pretty good playing over the last few games. You are Locked On Pistons, your daily Detroit Pistons podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's the deal? Welcome back to another episode of the Locked On Pistons podcast. Per usual, I'm your host, Kuka Hill. You can find me over on Twitter, at Kuka Hill. I want to thank you guys for making Locked On Pistons your first listen of every single day. We're free and available on all your podcast platforms. If you haven't already, head to the YouTube channel at Locked On Pistons. Hit that subscribe button or leave us a five-star review on whatever podcast platform you're listening to this on. That's another great way to support the podcast. And today's episode is brought to you by Prize Picks. The easiest, most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Go to prizepicks.com slash locked on NBA and use code all lowercase locked on NBA for a first deposit match up to $100. In today's episode, we'll talk about the rumored interest the Pistons have in a bigger name that is on the market. And also, are we getting a glimpse into the future of how the Pistons are wanting to play? A little small tweak that we saw in the Timberwolves game. I think maybe not a lot of people are noticing. We'll talk about that a little later, too. Um, But first, I want to talk about the play of Jane Ivey. And on the last podcast, we talked about Monty's comments after one of the games, admitting that they had an organizational meeting where basically it was, hey, let's get Jane Ivey the ball more. Why haven't you begin Jane Ivey the ball more? Why has it been used more, et cetera, et cetera? Um, And Monty took credit for it and was like, look, I just didn't do it. We talked about whether, you know, how big of a mistake that was, whether it's forgivable or not. We talked about that in the last episode. I just want to talk about how well Jane Ivey has played Since then, and over the last five games is where Ivy really has started to flourish and really started to get the ball in his hands a lot more. Over the last five games, he is averaging 23 points a game, 6.2 assists, 5.2 rebounds, shooting 46%, 46.8% from the field, 28.9% from deep on 7.6 attempts, and shooting 61% from the free throw line on 5.2 attempts. Now, we'll talk about his three-point percentage in just a second. But overall... Jane Ivey has been really damn good for the Detroit Pistons over the last few games. And obviously, it directly correlates with getting the ball a little bit more, running the the offense a little bit more, getting some more pick-and-roll reps. All of that stuff is directly correlating to Jane Ivey looking better on the basketball floor. And even before, even before um, him getting this increased usage, I thought he looked like he had improved in one specific area, and that was how well of a finisher he was around the rim. And I saw a stat a few days ago. I I don't have it on me, but I saw a stat. It was talking about people who's had the biggest improvement in finishing around the rim from last year to this year. And Jane, I believe, was like third. Because we talked about a lot last season, how he was like eighth percentile finishing around the rim, one of the worst finishers in the NBA. And now this year, according to Synergy, he's in the 42nd percentile at the rim. Um, On layups, he's he's in the 53rd percentile. So. Definitely a big improvement from last year to this year. Um, and just overall, you see when he gets the ball in his hands, he's just too quick and too fast for people. Like he, What he needs to continue to learn, I think he's already starting to learn it, and we saw it last year, is not learning how to like change pace um, and learning when to slow down and when to go full uh, full throttle. Uh, but when he just goes full throttle and he's just you know going his 100 speed, no one can really stop him in the NBA. It's, it's, it's hard to stop him without fouling him. Um, And he draws a lot of free throws because of that. Over the last um, five games, averaging 5.2 free throws. And a lot of that is just simply from guys not being able to beat him to the spot. The guys are going to follow him, trying to beat him to that spot. It's not like he gets fouled a lot, I feel like at least, at the rim. So much so he gets, I feel like he more so gets fouled on the way to the rim because guys can't keep up with them and they can't beat him to that spot. Um, So that you're seeing more and more of that, which I feel like a lot of fans already knew about with Jane Ivey. Um, and you're also seeing him playmake a little bit more for the Pistons, averaging 6.2 assists. He's a fine playmaker. I don't think he's a great playmaker, but he is someone who can be a secondary playmaker for the Pistons. When Cade's on the floor, if he needs a break or he needs someone to take some of the pressure off, Ivy is there to do that. He is a good enough playmaker to do that. He is a constant paint touch, and he is capable of making the right play, passing out, uh, kicking out to open shooters more often than not. Now, is he a tremendous playmaker? Is he one of the best playmakers out there? No, he still turns the ball over a lot. He has a sloppy handle at sometimes on the way to the rim. Sometimes he throws some 
uh, let me not say sometimes, I think his biggest issue, to be honest, is the fact that he tries to throw flashy passes when he doesn't need to, makes the pass way too hard for himself and ends up throwing turnovers. Uh, he throws a bad pass to a guy, so now a guy has to reach up here, has to reach down here, has to reach behind him. Instead of just simply throwing a regular pass, I think that's one of his biggest weaknesses that he really just needs to cut out. But he is a good enough playmaker to be the Pistons' secondary playmaker. And for a lot of the season, the Pistons just weren't using him at all as a playmaker. He just wasn't being used at all. And it didn't make much sense. And he's scoring really well. He's scoring efficiently, at least around the rim, and on two-pointers. And he's playmaking for the Detroit Pistons. Um, and I know it's not leading to wins. Nothing's leading to wins for the Pistons this year. So I'm not really too much looking into that. Um, but he's playing really well. He's playing how I think most Pistons fans expected him to play once he got the ball in his hands a little bit more. Um, and it's been a sight to see. He is a very fun player to watch get to the basket. He's a very fun player to watch uh, use his athleticism to beat guys and, and just fi- really physically impose his will on teams, not from a strength perspective, but from a speed and quickness perspective. There's a way to do that too, and he does that to defenses. He is a constant annoyance for defenses to try to guard because of how fast he is. Um, so you're seeing all that with Jane Ivey, and I even think he's looked – I don't think he's looked as good as he did last year with this, but he looks better over the last five games than he did beginning of this year. And that is on in the in-between area. The beginning of last year in the in-between area, he was awful, straight up awful. And then as the season went on, by the end of the year, I actually thought he turned that into a, a fine part of his game. It wasn't great, but it was a fine part. And then beginning of this year, it looked pretty awful again, like it did last year. Over the last five games, I think he's been fine in that area. Still not good, I don't think. But looks more like the guy I saw at the end of the last year in the in-between area, from in between the three-point line and the rim. He looks more like that guy, and I think that's a big development for his game, something I was really hoping to see him continue to develop on based off how I saw him at the end of last year. And you're seeing that a little bit more over the last few games since he started getting the ball in his hands more. Obviously, this correlates with Cade also being out. Um, it's going to be interesting to see how they use him and Cade together, or Monty uses them two together when they're back on the floor. Um, that's going to be a big thing for the Pistons' future. Um, and a lot of it will just boil down to get him the ball a little bit more. Kate should have the ball in his hands most, like obviously, but that doesn't mean Jane Ivy can't soak up some of those touches. Kate can play off ball. Kate is a good off ball player. Jane Ivy, you just need to get him some off, some on ball touches as well. Like there's no need for Kate to have to do every single thing. Ivy can do some of that too. Just give him some packages, give him some plays where he's orchestrating the offense and you allow him to get downhill. There's no need for, you know, it's not, it shouldn't be hard to get them both some reps within an offense, without within a 48-minute game. I don't think that should be too hard to do. Um, We'll see that when Kate eventually comes back. I will say this, and I know Pistons fans, they love Ivy so much to where if you say anything that's not a, a remotely 100% positive, they're ready to destroy you. And I, I, you know what? I'm ready to get destroyed for this. But it is concerning to me a little bit that he is not shooting well from beyond the arc, and he's not shooting well from the free throw line either. Like, usually good free throw shooters translate to good outside shooters. And I know Jane Ivey projected, for a lot of people who did draft stuff, projected to be a good shooter at the next level in college. But his first year, actually, he was a good catch-and-shoot three-point shooter. We talked about that a lot in open catch-and-shoot threes. But this year, he's taken a major step back. He's shooting 31% from three on the season. Over this five-game stretch where he's looked really good, he's not looking good from beyond the arc. He's shooting 29%, 28% from beyond the arc. And the reason why that concerns me, and he's shooting 61% from the free throw line over that stretch too, which is not, not don't want to see that. Um, and the reason why this is so concerning to me is because the whole idea behind drafting a guy like Asar Thompson and having Jalen Duren, the belief behind that was, well, Cage going to be a good, a good shooter and Ivy's going to be a good shooter. And as long as we get, you know, a third shooter in there that can space the floor, that will be enough spacing on the floor. Um, and you'll get enough threes up with those guys because of the playmaking You'll get enough open threes up because of the play making guys' ability to get to the basket and open up open shots for everyone else. Like that was the thinking behind it. But that was projecting that Cade and Ivy would both be good shooters. And Ivy has not been one this year. So I, I know that's more of a long term uh, thinking there, which I think the Pistons, actually, I, I'm not going to say think. I know the Pistons are looking more long term now. They're looking immediate, but their long term is immediate right now. Like they they know that Cade. There is no waiting two, three years. Their, their long-term now is next year. So a lot of that belief was built in the idea of, okay, well, Ivy's going to be a good shooter. If Ivy's not a good shooter, which I, I'm, we're only we're halfway through the season, it can change by the end of the year. I told you guys I evaluate the season in quarters. So we're like in the second quarter, at the end of the second quarter of the year. So we have a full half of the season to go. 
and things can completely change. He can get back to shooting well and end the season on a good streak. And all of a sudden, yeah, he's a good shooter. But over the last 23 games, we've seen Cade, when he's made this leap that we've all witnessed, he looks like a good shooter. He's been a good shooter. He's shooting 37% from beyond the arc. Um, or 36%, I'm sorry. 36% from three on pull-up attempts and catch and shoot. Like those are, he's taking the, I, I'd say some difficult threes. And Cade's becoming a good three-point shooter. If if Ivy is not able to be a good three-point shooter, that changes everything with your plans. So I don't know when the Pistons want to decide and make a decision on that kind of thing. And that doesn't mean moving off from Ivy. That maybe means moving off someone else or building the team in a different way. Because the current iteration of the team is built behind the idea of Cade's going to be a good shooter. Ivy's also going to be a really good shooter, and they'll get another good shooter to make up for Asar and Durant. If that's not going to, if that's not true, if that's not how it's going to be, I'm not saying it, that means move Ivy. That just means you need to rethink how you're building the team then outside of that. That's all I'm saying. So that's what I'm watching for this year. And if, if Ivy continues to not shoot well, I think that's something 100% the Pistons need to reevaluate when it comes to building this team moving forward. Because again, I'll say it one more time a large part of that belief or built. The, the belief behind building the team this way, again, is because they assumed Cade will be a good shooter and Ivy will be a really good shooter as well. If that's not the case, you need to reevaluate some things. And again, I'll say it one more. I've said it like three times. I'll say it one more time so those Jane Ivy stands don't freak out. That is not me. I'm saying trade Ivy. That just means you need to reevaluate the building of this team. You can keep Ivy, that just, but you need to get other pieces then around them if that's not going to be what ends up happening. Like that's, that's all I'm saying. So that's what I'll be watching for. But overall, just Jane Ivey's performance, he's playing really well. And Monty, please give him the ball. Keep giving him the ball. It's the right thing to do. It's the obvious thing to do. Just keep giving the dude the ball. It's not too hard. Um, when we come back, the Pistons are interested in a bigger name that is on the market. We'll talk about who that is when we come back. But first, I've got to tell you guys about one of our sponsors, Price Picks. And Price Picks is one of my favorite sponsors of the podcast. It's the largest daily fantasy sports platform in North America. They are the easiest, most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. It's just you against the numbers. Instead of battling a thousand of other players, including pros and sharks, you pick more than or less than on two to six player stat projections, and you watch the winnings roll in. And one of the favorite things about Price Picks is that there's cross sports entries with just about every sport out there, whether it's basketball, football. Hockey, baseball, esports. They have literally every sport out there. Volleyball, soccer. They have every sport you can think of on this app, and you can do cross sports entries. But honestly, the best thing about Price Picks for anyone who's involved in fantasy, they know injuries can absolutely ruin everything for you. But with Price Picks, they offer a reboot policy, so your entries stay in play even if one of your players gets injured. For example, if you have a have a uh, an entry with a football or basketball player, and they exit the game in the first half and don't return in the second half, other places, you're a out of luck you're screwed this with price picks that player is rebooted price picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy so go to pricepicks.com slash locked nba and use code locked nba for a first deposit match up to a hundred dollars again go to pricepicks.com slash locked nba and use code locked nba for a first deposit match up to a hundred dollars price picks is daily fantasy sports made easy So I want to thank you guys again for being locked on Pistons, your first listen of every single day. We're free and available on all your podcast platforms. If you haven't already, head to the YouTube channel at Locked on Pistons. Hit that subscribe button or leave us a five-star review on whatever podcast platform you're listening to this on. That's another great way to support the podcast. So over the last few days, you're obviously seeing some moves happen throughout the NBA. Um, you saw Pascal Siakam get traded. We've seen OG Ananobi get traded. And with a few weeks to go until the trade deadline, you're going to continue to hear not only hear some of these rumors, but you're going to see trades start to happen. It's going to be a very fun month, I think, um, as an NBA fan. I think it's even going to be a fun month for Pistons fans when it comes to um, hearing rumors and, and doing fake trades and hearing what they're interested in, what could happen, and then potentially seeing some actual moves happen. So I think it's going to be interesting. Um, before we get into who is reportedly uh, who the Pistons are reportedly interested in, I want to say this, and we talked about this on a podcast like a few weeks ago when 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 Tom Gores came out and spoke to the public and mentioned that they had a lot of salary cap space and that they're, you know, and then people talk about the free agency market coming up this offseason. And Troy Weaver went on World's podcast and said, you know, we have cap space, we have flexibility, we can go do this, like all that stuff. And people kept mentioning free agency. 
even 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 the front office and ownership mentioned free agency as well. Uh, two weeks, a few weeks later, you're seeing why that whole free agency idea is pure BS. It, it's pure BS, and that's why I believe that the Pistons are planning to use all this cap, or and maybe not all of it, but a lot of this cap space within the next few weeks. Because as you're seeing, two of the guys that the Detroit Pistons apparently were rumored to be interested in as of like the end of December was OG Ananobi and Pascal Siakam. Guys like that, they're good players, they're really good players that are entering free agency, never actually hit free agency. This is not 2011 no more. This is not 2012, 2013, 2014, 15, 16. That's not where we're at. This is not the era of basketball anymore. Guys do not hit free agency like that. Those kind of players do not hit free agency. They are traded for and then extended. They are traded for on large, they, they sign big contracts with their current team and then traded for. Or if they're on expiring, like I just said, they're traded for and then extended. These guys do not reach free agency. So if your whole idea is to build everything through free agency, you are going to be screwed, which you now see the Pistons are screwed right now. You have to be active in the trade market. Now you can create cap space to be active in the trade market, which they have. So hopefully they do what it sounds like they're trying to do and what I've heard they're trying to do and actually use this cap space, cap space in the trade market. But the idea that they're going to have all this cash space for free agency, look, all these guys are going to be in free agency. First of all, the free agency class was weak in and of itself anyways. And then second of all, it's going to get even weaker because I guarantee you it's not going to be just Pascal and OG Ananobi that don't even reach free agency. This has been a trend in the NBA for years. That's not how it works anymore. If you want a guy, you have to trade for them and then extend them or trade for a guy who's already on a long contract. That's, that's the only way you're going to be able to do it. Yeah, you'll be able to make some free agency signings, but rarely ever are you going to be able to get these big, impactful guys in free agency. It just doesn't work like that anymore. So you are seeing, you saw evidence of that. That was the whole point of what I'm trying to say. OG Ananobi, he's at the Knicks now. It is what it is. Pascal, now he's in Indiana. There you go. Now that's two guys off the table. Like That's just what's going to continue to happen if the Pistons have cold feet and plan on just waiting for free agency every year. This is what's going to continue to happen every single time because this is just not how the NBA is and how you build teams anymore in the NBA. Um, but anyways, now we can get to who it is that they were rumored to be interested in, and that is DeJounte Murray of the Atlanta Hawks. According to Ian Begley, he reported that the Detroit Pistons are showing a level of interest in DeJounte Murray. Now, if you guys have been listening to the podcast over the last few weeks, I had been saying that I was hearing that the Pistons have shown interest and have talked about adding or protect maybe not let me not say adding because it's not like they're a full throttle going after a guy they have to get this dude like they're not at that point but they have discussed going after some of these bigger names that are on the market they have shown a level of interest and, and i don't know how high the interest is or how low the interest is but they have shown a level of interest in some of these bigger names and dejounte murray yes was one of the names that i had been hearing i wasn't going to say it myself I'm not trying to break news. That's not what I'm trying to do out here. I'm not going to, you're barely ever going to see me break news on here. Um, I'll leave little breadcrumbs for people, but I'm not going to just come out here and break news. But when stuff does get reported, I will confirm if that was what I was talking about or not. And that is what I've heard, that they did have a level of interest, or they had, I don't know if they currently do, but they have had interest in DeJounte Murray, and they have reached out to the Hawks before, and they have had some kind of talk or interest in him. Should they have interest in DeJounte Murray, though, is the question. I think this is this is what I'll say about this. DeJounte Murray is a really good player. I'm not going to get with everyone who tries to say that every player who isn't an all-star is just trash. DeJounte Murray is a really good basketball player. Now, where you want him, where you th- how good of a really good basketball player you think he is, okay, you can argue about that. But let's let's start at the basis that he is a really good basketball player. That 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 is where I'm going to start at. And if you if we can't gr- agree on that, I'm just not going to mess with, like I'm not going to argue about it. Um he is he's a fine, he's a really good basketball player. But does he address what the Pistons need? I don't know. All I know is, is what the Detroit Pistons plan is, what they are thinking. Whatever move they make is not going to be to try to save this year. Whatever move they make is because it's a guy they believe will help them immediately next year and for years to come. That's what they're making moves right now for, to see it play out for the rest of this year, get reps with that, and then be ready to immediately help win next year. So it's not whatever trade they make, don't say win now, because it's not to win right now. It's for next year and years beyond. That's whoever they're going to trade for. 
So if they believe that DeJounte Murray is a guy that will help them win immediately next year and will fit with Cade, then go after him. Go, go do it. If that's what you feel, if that's what they believe, then go do it. Whoever they believe will fit with Cade and help Cade win games immediately next year, go after that said player, whether it's DeJounte Murray, whether it's Zach Levine, whether it's Tobias Harris, whether it's whether it's Quentin Grimes, whoever these names are on the market, if you believe that that player is going to fit with Cade and will play and, and help them win next year, then go after him. I will say, I'll just simply say some of the positives with DeJounte Murray. He's younger than some of the options on the market. Zach Levine's older. DeJounte's 27. Um, the contract he's on is also cheaper than the contract that Zach Levine is on. Zach Levine's on like a $40 million contract. DeJounte's getting paid 17 this year, 24 next year, 26, 28. That's not a bad contract at all. So that's the two positives. And this year, he is shooting 38% from deep. Now, I know for the majority of his career, he has not been that good of a three-point shooter. But I will say that since 2020, not only has his attempts increased every single year from 3 to 4.3 to 5.2 to 6.0, his percentage has increased every single year with that from 31.7 to 32.7 to 34.4 to now 38.3. So I don't think it's far-fetched to believe that he's continuing to get better as a three-point shooter because we've seen that happen for the last four years. He's not the defender he was in San Antonio at the beginning of his career. Maybe he can get back to that. He has shown that that is something that he has within him. Now, whether it actually is going to come out, I mean, that, the Pistons would have to believe whether they can get that out of him again. But I think he's a really good player. I don't know if he would fit. I, I'm not sure. I think a lot of this has to do with – I know I've had some people, and I'll leave it off here. I, I know I've seen some fans say, why are they trying to go after another guard? Well, I think it, it speaks to two things. Um, I said I think I said this on the last podcast. They view Cade and Asar as versatile position players on defense, to where Cade's at a position where he can guard threes, and they believe Asar can be a three or four. That's what I believe is why they're going after guards. Because if they can play a guard, if they can go get, let's say they get DeJounte Murray. Let's, I'm, let's just say they do. And they do, let's just say they do it without giving up Ivy. I, I think it probably would require Ivy. I think if you do a deal with the Hawks, you're probably getting DeJounte Murray on another one of their contracts, like Hunter or someone like that. Um, well, let's say they keep Ivy. Let's just say that. And they go Cade, Ivy, DeJounte, Asar, and Durant. I think the reason why they be have a level of belief to do that because they think Cade will be able to guard threes and Asar can guard fours. I think that's what that's what their belief would be behind doing something like that. Um, or maybe they might just trade one of those guys and and, and get a, a guy like DeJounte or Zach Levine or someone who's a guard. Um, that's just simply to answer the question of those who are saying, well, why are they why do they why are they linked to guards? Um, that's an, that's one reason. I think the other reason is they just want to win next year. They they want to win next year. They have pressure to win next year. And Kate's taking that that step right now to where he's ready to win right now. So I think they have more pressure to win next year. So they're going to get players that help them win immediately, as and, and opposed to waiting for every player to hit their ceiling and then be ready to win. I, I think that's where the 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 disagreements and and uh, the confusions at, but. I know this is going to be a heated topic. I know a lot of Pistons fans don't want DeJounte Murray because they think that spells the end of Jay and Ivy. Um, so I know this is going to be a heated one. I want to hear from you guys, though, still. Comment section down below or over on Twitter at Kuka Hill. When we come back, did we get a glimpse into the future of how the Pistons want to utilize one of their players? We'll talk about that when we come back as well. But first, I've got to tell you guys about one of our sponsors, Jace Medical. I know we come to sports to escape from some of the crazy realities of life, but can we just talk for a minute about preparing for real life? According to the FDA, pharmacies are running out of antibiotics like amoxicillin right in the middle of the worst flu season in over a decade, and that is absolutely scary. I can't imagine a more helpless feeling that if one of my family members or my wife, one of my brothers or sisters, my mom, dad, got sick while a supply chain issue kept them from the life-saving medication that they needed. And thankfully, we'll be okay because of Jace Medical. The Jace case is a pack of five different antibiotics to treat a long list of bacterial illnesses, including UTIs, respiratory infections, sinuses, skin infection, among others. This stuff could happen to any of us. So visit jacemedical.com and complete your physician encounter. It will be reviewed by a board-certified physician, and your medications will be dispensed by a licensed pharmacy at a fraction of the regular cost. It's never been more important to be prepared than today. So go to jacemedical.com and use offer code locked on to get $20 off your order. Again, 
That's jacemedical.com and use offer code L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N, locked on, to get $20 off your order. So I want to thank you guys again for making Locked On Pistons your first listen of every single day. Free and available on all your podcast platforms. If you haven't already, head to the YouTube channel at Locked On Pistons. Hit that subscribe button or leave us a five-star review on whatever podcast platform you're listening to us on. That's another great way to support the podcast. Um, just real quickly, I think we might have seen a glimpse into how the Pistons maybe are looking to use Asar Thompson. And no, I'm not talking about in pick and roll or as a screener or in DHOs or having them run the pick and roll himself. I think all that is a given. I, I hope at some point you start to see that be a consistent basis of how they use Asar. All those versatile ways to use him on the offensive end that doesn't require just sitting in the corner. I hope that's the case at some point. We're not there yet, but hopefully at some point that's what they do. But I think we're moving towards that because in this last game against the Minnesota Timberwolves, they traded they traded Marvin Bagley. And I was under the assumption that, okay, well, they got rid of Marvin Bagley. It looks like James Wiseman is going to get the rest of the year to showcase whether he can be the backup big for the team and get to showcase his skills for the rest of the NBA for when he hits a restricted free agency. That's what I assumed was going on. But in the first game, and it was only one game, it, 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 things can change. But in the first game since the trade, the guys were active. It was not James Wiseman who got the backup five minutes. It was Mike Muscala. And why did they, why, what was the reasoning for playing Mike Muscala at the five? Well, because Mike Muscala can hypothetically shoot threes and will space guys out and, and take away a defender from the basket. Now, he shot 0 of 3 in this game, and he has been a bad shooter this year. So I don't know if he actually is going to be able to do what they want him to do. But hypothetically, a guy who throughout his career has been a good shooter outside of this year, that's was, that was the idea. And why did they do that? So they could have one less guy from the rim and let Asar Thompson operate around the basket, where they're using him in screen and roll, where they're using him in the dunker spot, where they're allowing him to have space to drive to the basket and not have to meet a defender at the rim who's waiting for him when you know he's playing with a Jalen Duran, maybe. Or a James Wiseman. So it looks like maybe, and I'm interested to see if they do this in this next game or if that was just a one-game experiment. Again, Mike Muscala isn't the greatest you know, player to try this with because he hasn't been good this year. But the idea behind it stays the same. It's just this is the best option the Pistons have to try it with right now. It looks like maybe they're thinking about going that route of we're going to play a spacing five, a stretch five with Asar Thompson off the bench, and we're going to let Asar just operate at the basket. That, that's going to be his job. That's what he's going to do. We're going to give him space to do what he likes to do. And I think that could be a smart idea. I still think that you can, I, I think it's very, I don't want to say very easy, but it's very, I think it's clear. You can still use a SAR and Durant on the floor at the same time. You just have to be creative with it. You can't just put a SAR in the corner. Like, yeah, you have to actually involve a SAR in the actions. But to be easier, you can just play him with four other spacers and let him be the guy that is like the inside presence, I'd say. And I thought it looked pretty good in the minutes uh, they tried it. Now, I, I, again, Mike Muscala is not the greatest player to do it with. He's not hitting shots right now. He's not a good. He hasn't been a good player this year. But I think they were giving us a glimpse into how they're thinking about using Asar, not with Mike Muscala long term, but with maybe another stretch big down the line. I think I think we saw a glimpse of that. I'm interested to see how they go about this back of five rotation moving forward. Um, it was incredibly, <clears throat> excuse me. It was incredibly interesting for me seeing that James Wiseman did not get these minutes and Mike Muscala did. I think that was on, obviously it was on purpose and for a reason. So that was my read into it. Let me know what you guys thought about that though. Comment section down below or over on Twitter at Cuckoo Hill. That's all I've got for you guys today. Thank you guys for making Lockdown Pistons your first listen of every single day. Free and available on all your podcast platforms. Hit that subscribe button at the YouTube channel. Leave us a five-star review, whatever podcast platform you're listening to this on. Until next time, I'll see you guys later. Stay safe out there. Till next time, peace out.